Blake, what do you think I'm going to have for lunch today? I think you're going to have your seventh taco of the day. Welcome to the Church Gear Podcast, where we pull the tech out of the booth and onto the stage to share the most outlandish stories and hidden wisdom from the tech trenches. And now, here are your hosts. I'm your host, Blake Hodges, a man who could maybe eat two tacos a day, but definitely couldn't eat them for breakfast. And I'm here with uh, my co-host who eats tacos for breakfast every single day with a side of smoothie, Toby Walters. I actually love breakfast tacos. That's one of the things I miss most about Texas because they're really big there. Oh, okay. It's kind of like a Texas thing. Um, And I'm sure I've done this in my life, but I have wanted to like one day do breakfast tacos, tacos for lunch, tacos for dinner, like even maybe a dessert taco at at night. That's intense. I know, but it'd be kind of my perfect day. And so we are in, I mean, you would call it halftime because you're a, you're a big football fan. I love football. And I would call it lunch break because I love lunch so much. Lunch and break. <laughs> yeah, we're halfway through uh, Tim Foote's episode. So our audience would have heard, what, part one last week. That's and right. And we're at part two. And I mean, I just, he has so much wisdom and good advice. And it's like, it's a bountiful lunch meal. <laughs> and one thing we never mentioned, which I feel like is a benefit, is churches should pay for just like taking people to lunch. That should be a benefit. Mm. You're saying like they should pay for their staff to go to lunch. Uh, when I uh, connect with churches, oftentimes we go to lunch. And so if it's if they reach out and they invite me to lunch, then they pay for it on the church. And if I invite them out and, and I pay for it on the company. And it was a joke that uh, here at Church Gear, we're trying to hire a finance director just to, you know, continue to become a, you know, better organized organization. And one of my jokes was that I'm afraid that the finance director would immediately cancel all my lunches. Toby, you know, you own Church Gear, right? I, I know, will stiff but... arm this finance director. There's a couple things in life you need. You need lunch to stay happy. <laughs> and it's true. And we are like, deep into my lunch hour on these episodes right now. Did you realize that? Like I am almost two hours late to lunch right now. My mouth is literally hanging open because yeah, I've never seen you make it this far past lunch and you haven't even complained one bit. No. And it's all because of Tim foot. Like that guy is, that's the one, one of the very few things in this world that's even better than lunch. Do you think his, the Tim, the Tim foot, uh, lunch break is kind of holding you over. You're just eating so much of his wisdom. It's kind of keeping you full. It is very meaty stuff, you know? (laughs) Okay. Well, let's get back to our episode with Tim foot. Okay. Uh, another question. Are you, I'm sure I'm sure that churches come to you and they say, we want to do a candidate search for X, Y, and Z, and, you know, everything from lead pastor down to, you know, whatever it is. Are you seeing a, you know, a larger tendency in the technical positions to have to coach the churches to raise the salary range as opposed to, you know, they come with, we want to do a senior pastor search and we have X salary and you say, okay, that's in line versus we want to do a tech director search and we want to pay them 55 a year. Like, are you having to do more coaching around raising the salary range in technical positions than other positions? I would say it's it's across the board. I would say we see it in next gen ministry. I would say we see it some in worship ministry. Um, we definitely see it in production tech ministry. But I think right now there's a a, a cultural crisis going on with inflation across most roles. And I think, too, there's a slowdown in hiring because uh, churches are seeing that they have to raise the salaries of who they have uh, in order for them to be able to live in in a, uh, to have quality of life. And so they're, and they're realizing that if they lose that person to a, to a better salary or a sunnier zip code or a cooler zip code, that's not like <laughs> Texas where you can bake bread in your mailbox right now. Then, then Tim's not going, lying, guys. That's on the internet. That's a real is. thing that happened. Yeah. Then, then it's going to cost them more because they're going to have to pay more to, well, they're going to have to, you pay a search fee probably to find a new person and then pay them a higher salary than they'll pay the old person. So it's like, okay, we're looking at essential hiring right now. We're looking at raising salaries for the leaders that we have on staff. So we can't be going out and hiring people. We're seeing church staff do more on Alina staff because they're having to right size salaries. Mm. So we're seeing it across the board. 
Okay, so let's talk about expectations. So Blake wants to, you know, consider himself a qualified candidate for a church, and he's looking for a position in the, you know, 75K plus range. What are churches expecting of candidates when they're willing to pay fair and premium salaries for tech directors and other positions and production roles? Experience. They're looking for, they're, they're expecting to have experience. They're expecting to have a high skill level. They're expecting to have somebody who can build a ministry. They're expecting to have somebody who is g- really good with people and high EQ that they can lead in both directions. Mm. Are you having to coach churches more on their expectations or coach candidates more on becoming an ideal candidate? Because there is the flip side of this. We want to be fair to the churches. Like, yeah, there's sometimes mm. you have. You have to have it readjust expectations the other direction. Yeah, uh, both. We're having to do it on both sides. Okay. Um, oh, wait. Scrolling on the outline, you're making me. You're making me miss it. Um, what? I'm gonna be. Let's put them on the hot seat one more time. Okay. Um, Ooh, come on. When churches, and I'm assuming you're not doing candidate searches for them, but when churches are saying, "Look, it's 45 to 50. That's all we got. It's 45 even." Like, do you say, well, hey, you can expect X, Y, Z, like one year experience might be a, a grouch, might whatever. <laughs> I don't know. I would say, given the fact that I'm on the hot seat, I would say you're looking for somebody with little experience, but has a skill set because you're not going to, I mean, there's no point throwing 25,000 at somebody who doesn't have a skill set. So you're going to you're going to get a skill set at 45 but you're probably not going to get experience and it's going to be very rare that they uh have a natural ability to lead a team or build a team of volunteers. You may have somebody older who um is stepping in um at the at the other side of their career. Sometimes that's a great find, but they may not have moved with the the development in the tech world. Some have um, but you're going. You you haven't got a lot of givens at at a, at your 45k range. And again, you're dealing with reality of you're getting someone with little experience. You're going to have to mm. pour into them and develop them, and then they're right. going to be worth 65 in a few years. So are you just going to yeah, do and the they're going to be again? bivocational? Yeah, they're probably going to be bivocational too because you can't live on 45. Do you ever uh, coach churches with uh, a different concept of saying, okay, if 45 is all you can afford, maybe you want someone who's full-time outside or a contractor and just work 15 to 20 hours a week who's highly skilled and highly experienced? Yes, we, we, we absolutely do that, Toby. But we also want to talk to the church about, okay, what's the future for this? Like uh, we always want to move churches towards um, having an inbuilt community and somebody who can pastor that community and giving them a sense of vision for what this ministry area could be and needs to be for the future. Oh, it's tough. Yeah. I, the point you bring up about, and I, I wish there was a way we could send this. And honestly, I would, I would put this in here as a bonus question. Like if you're a tech director hearing this, how do you send this to your exec pastor? You're you're not going to just text him a link to the episode. Um, but like what you say is so true. And I wish every exec pastor could hear it because Caleb Lepke said the same thing. Like he had, he had told his church, if I lose one of these guys, I'm going to end up paying the next guy 10, 20 more. And then we're going to have to find them. It's going to be six months to train them. Like you might as well do some retention work instead. So if you're right. the tech hearing this thinking, I don't want to leave. I love this church. But I need about 10K more so where I'm not like living paycheck to paycheck, which, Tim, the amount of write-in responses that we got that said things yeah. like, I don't want to be a millionaire. I just want to not live paycheck to right. paycheck broke my heart. How do yeah. you even – what do you do? Like how do you, how do you broach this to the exec pastor after you finish yeah. this episode? I think – one. I mean, shout out to exec pastors because some of them might be listening and that's commendable. Um, they have so much on their plates that they're dealing with right now. So many stresses that exec passes are, are walking through in this cultural moment as far as church staff and taking care of staff goes. Um, so walk into that room or that coffee meeting or that lunch with compassion for the exec pastor and, and what they're dealing with and then uh, affirm them and their leadership and then also start open with your love for the church and your struggle with the current salary that you're on and start with, hey, what do you need to see from me for it to make sense for you to invest 
more in my in, in my leadership and my in, in my uh, my salary. So ask those questions. Never go in with statements. This is not enough. I feel undervalued. Uh, undervalued. Ne- never walk in with definitive statements. Walk in with questions. And uh, even pointing out the obvious, it's going to be really tough to walk in and have a conversation with your executive pastor if you don't have a relationship with your executive pastor. Mm-hmm. So build that relationship, that trust. Absolutely. And you know, be someone worth more money. Some text listening... The brutal fact is you're not worth more money because you're not investing in the church with all your heart. Yeah. Ooh, that's tough. Um, that's tough. Would Let me ask one more tactical, brutal question. We're going to release like all the data at the end of this on a PDF on our site, uh, churchtechpay.com. Uh, would you say like, share the PDF with your pastor, like not passive aggressively, not cold Turkey, but just like, Hey, just so you know, like here's some data on, on what the current landscape is. Would you use that if you were a church tech to kind of in a loving kind way, say like, I'm, I'm not going crazy here. Like this is the the numbers and I, you know, I need a little more or whatever. I, I'd be really sensitive in how you do it. I mean, what Toby said is correct with the biggest breakdown we see on church staffs nationally is a lack of relational context. And when there's when there's not relationship, everything becomes personal. You don't have you don't have a filter for things, and so you want to do this through relationship. You want to build a relationship, even where possible, with your supervisor or executive pastor or senior leader. And then, as you ask those questions, just say, "Hey, I've been listening to this podcast. It's been really helpful in developing my leadership. But they've also done a, a series on church salaries, and I realize that I'm that that I'm under the national average. And uh, I love this place. I want to stay here long term. Um, so my question to you is: Is there growth potential for me here? Is there growth potential in my salary? And you don't need an answer today, but to help you, it might be helpful for you to see what I'm seeing. So I'm going to send you the, the the salary survey from from Church Gear. That was well said. I think that's great. Very well said. Tim, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and Blake, you can attest to this. Like, there are humble ways to stroke your boss's personality. Or, um, <laughs> oh my gosh! I'm sorry, I said that wrong. We're gonna have to cut that moment out. <laughs> no, it's staying. <laughs> the humble ways to stroke your boss's ego. Does that still sound? <laughs> Toby's heart is in the right place here. How do you say that without it sounding creepy? Uh, the new way would there be to... Humble, di- there are humble ways to invest in your supervisor. You can How dap that. Yeah, there's culturally appropriate ways to dap your boss up. So I want to give executive pastors and just church leaders the benefit of the doubt. Like They love developing people. Like That is their heart and why they're in ministry. And so when church production people humbly approach their leaders and say... Hey, I, you know, like we said, I love being here. I love this ministry. I want to be here long term. What can I be doing to develop myself into somebody mm-hmm. that's going to be able to afford to stay here long term as I get married and grow a family? And right you know, question. What are you looking for in an eventual expert in my field? And how can I work towards becoming that? So you don't have to outsource somebody else for this job in the future. Yes. That's great, Toby. Okay, Blake, start doing that with me. Hey, listen, I, if you want to make more than $7 and 25 cents, we did give you a raise behind your back. I give you many compliments <laughs> on like, I think I'm going to get in trouble here with my fellow coworkers. Cause you never rule a life, never tell your boss that they pay you well, but I think church gear on average pays above average of most places. Um, mm-hmm. which is why some of these numbers were so shocking. <laughs> like I don't want to reel too much, but I was just like the 30 to 40 is the most common salary range. I was like, this is insane. Like, mm. yeah. Yep. Um, Toby, hit us with uh, some of the benefits packages. Okay, Tim. I don't want to hear your benefits package. <laughs> <laughs> I may be in the minority here, but I think oftentimes benefits can be overstated, overemphasized, where like benefits hold some value, certainly. But I've had jobs where benefits were great, and I've had other jobs where benefits kind of sucked. And I've also, for the last... 15 years, just bought my own health and invested my own retirement benefits. And it's not that expensive compared to terrible benefits. So are there just, is there a spectrum where some churches are offering incredible benefits and other churches are kind of like, eh, they're bare minimum. Well, and also keep in mind, Toby goes to a witch doctor, so she doesn't (laughs) charge that much. I drink smoothies every morning, Blake. It, 
It's across the board, but we love working with churches that have great benefits because it, it a good benefits package actually communicates culture. But we also know that uh, it's it's expensive for an organisation too to provide good benefits. Um, are benefits important? It depends on on where you are in life. I mean, you talk about that video director that the church takes a chance on and invests in who's 22, 23. Do they care about benefits? Heck no, they're probably still <laughs> on their parents. Uh, but if you're but if you're over 30 or over 35 or have a family, benefits get more and more important. So, I mean, it's it's right across the board and right across the spectrum. But yes, benefits are important. Benefits communicate culture. I mean, health insurance was our top response other than just like, I'd like to get paid more. Health insurance kept coming up over and over again. Yeah, see? Like saying it was either, you know, they were on their fan, their their spouse's insurance and I sensed a little bit of shame there, which I experienced yeah. that for a time. I know what that, I don't know, actually, I don't really care. But like, I could <laughs> sense it in theirs. Um, I don't have any shame. But like, the benefits kept coming up and up and up and up. And I was like, there's no benefits. Like, I've got kids. So like, do you and, ever- and I was, I'll, yeah, and I'll say there's no shame on being your, on your spouse's benefits. It would be nice if you could get it from the church, but maybe that's God's provision to allow you to be a, a part of this great enterprise in the world called the local church. So remember that there's no shame. There's just an opportunity to be on mission in a local church that can't afford benefits. But if if a church can and has that option, it's, def, it, it's definitely a great thing. You ever find yourself, oh, you go, Toby. Do you ever find yourself trying to talk churches into offering benefits packages or is that too far on y'all's purview? Oh, no. We'll, I mean, this is why we love partnering with churches. We're going to tell the truth uh, sensitively, but often churches just can't. I mean, it's they're, they're not in a position where they can afford to do that. And then we'll talk about, okay, what does a stipend look like? What are some other ways that you can communicate culture that aren't benefits? You know, it's it's those kinds of conversations that we'll often have. So let's talk about, um, I, I kind of look at it as two sides of benefits. You have health and retirement, which are very traditional, you know, benefits package that cost the organization sometimes a lot of money. And then you have the other side where you have just flexibility, culture, time off, vacation, all of that on the benefit side, which would you say, like, is there one over the other that is more important to stress? I think it depends on the individual, what they value most. Um, I think that I think churches, well, churches who have a, a, a solid benefits package when it's when it's health, health and retirement or a match or something like that will often forget the value of the other side. And that is, okay, quality of life, investment in the family. What does it look like if a family has moved from uh, New York to or New York State to California and they're missing their family? What have you provided uh, X amount of money towards a trip home every year? Or what does that look like? What are some what are some extra ways that you can communicate love, care, and value for that family? During Christmas and Easter, you know, what if you sent, you know, Grubhub cards to to the family? Family of the tech director because you know that they're pulling so many extra hours. What are ways that you can communicate culture through benefits that are unique to your church and environment? And if you are working with a church that, you know, maybe they have a benefits package, maybe it's very small, or maybe they even don't have a benefits package on the health and retirement side, are you then trying to coach them in, okay, you really need to push and make up for this on the other side with flexibility and time off and culture? Like it's got to be a great place to work if you're not going to provide great health and retirement benefits. We'll, abs we'll absolutely have those kinds of conversations. What, what else do you do? Or tell us about the culture of the organization and how that's communicated to, to the people on your team. You have, and it's usually a small. It's usually a smaller team when there's no when there's not a benefits package, so it's easier to get to the heart of of how they operate as a team, how they connect as a team. Uh, it's 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 usually a, a more straightforward conversation. Uh, I'd like to do uh, devil's advocate for the church, which that's a funny statement um, here. But I think you know because I hear it in the millennials. Like there's a lot of millennials when they. I almost said a curse word when they complain about their jobs. <laughs> I want to say, you know, your job's not like a genie in a bottle. I know there's some corporations that have all the money in the world, but that's not most of them. And like, you're being unrealistic here. Um, is there a number? I think it might be helpful because we had so many comments on benefits to kind of give our TDs a spectrum of like, 
Is there a number of a uh, church size where you're like, if you're not offering benefits, this is ridiculous? Because I think that might help people on both ends either say, well, we should have benefits or, well, yeah, Tim says like churches of this size and under, they, they just can't really do it. It's not that they're evil. They just, you can't afford it at that size. So at the risk of overgeneralizing, we'd, we'd be very surprised if there was a church over a thousand that weren't, wasn't offering benefits. And that's me generalizing. But we've seen church planters that have uh, prioritized this so much that they're offering benefits from the get-go. So we see it we we see it right across the spectrum. And just as somebody who buys my own health care for the last 15 years, like there are plans out there for families that are, right. you know, four to six hundred dollars a month for decent coverage. Yeah. And if you do that math, that's, you know, $5,000 a year. So, you know, that's the literal value of those benefits um, on that specific instance, $5,000 a year. Um, So just sometimes do the math. If you're looking at a job that's 55 grand and has benefits versus a job that's 70 grand and doesn't, you know, simply do the math. Well, and Tim, do you ever find, we asked, uh, we asked, oh gosh, was it Matt or Mike? the really attractive Matt, Matt exec pastor. We asked, yeah, him. We asked him, like, do you ever negotiate? <laughs> oh, I wish you hadn't said that. I'm going to have to tell him now that you called him the <laughs> Please do. attractive Look, exec pastor. He's top three attractive <laughs> guests I think we've had. Yeah. He's, oh, Tim's number one, of course. Well, yes, but that's his accent. <laughs> so, Tim, tell me this. Would you be a little touchy on a negotiation and say, hey, I did the math, like Toby said. I want to. I need about 5K more because y'all don't do benefits. Would you be that direct with it? I think you read the room. You know, it's, it's how much do you want this role? How important is it to you? Um, but you've got to remember this. You know, when you're in the interview stage, you're outside of the fishbowl and you have a great opportunity to do all kinds of negotiation. If you're going to have that conversation, don't have it when you're in the fishbowl. Have it before. So you're saying do that in the interview process. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I mean, but but also read the room. Don't don't lead with compensation and package. You know, you want to you want to fall in love first. You want the violins to be playing. You want to be right up to negotiation <laughs> stage before you get into that kind of detail. Toby, where were the violins when you hired me? I, I want some violins. Uh, I had a tiny violin, you know, just weeping for my future. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'd and appreciate if you'd put some violins in post, if you do post perfect. with these things. <laughs> Ross will get right on that. Come on, Ross. Give me a violin. And, um, you know, another reality is you don't have the relational equity yet of, you know, if you've been there a year or two and are crushing your role and have a great relationship with your pastor, you have relational equity to perhaps get a pay bump that you couldn't have gotten when the church is trying to decide if they want to invest in you before they hire you. So right. you got to play both sides of that. Well, hang on. There's another bunny trail there. Is there a magic? I'm just throwing you curveballs here. Is there a magic number when you've been at a place where you see a good pay bump? Is it like, hey, after five years, that's when you really negotiate for that pay bump or 10 years or, hey, look, after that first year, that's actually the best year to say, you've seen me, here I am. Five years is a good one because we see, I mean, Part of the uh, the anecdotal average we see is leaders stay two years or less. I mean, that's why we got into this work because we want to see leaders stay longer because that's when amazing ministry happens. But uh, that's why I always say in the interview process, talk about what when when you're talking to the hiring organization, say, hey, what's your vision for for, for me in this role? If I'm your if I'm your person, if I'm your leader, what do you want to see in two years? What do you want to see in five years? What do we want to see in ten years? Because that communicates that you want to last and you want to stay and you want longevity but uh sometimes uh that uh, a, a hiring organization will bake into the the package a bonus for longevity well toby you and me are hitting three years this year so we've only got two more years before we get to negotiate more money you'll have to negotiate <laughs> soon, like like too soon <laughs> well toby has to negotiate with brian now for like, money so like, i'm trying to help like, him stop 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 <laughs> And uh, just trying to help you out, Toby, you know, just thinking as a business owner, which, you know, an XP or a pastor is, is kind of that it's a ministry, but you know, they're thinking if a candidate comes to them after a year and asks for a, you know, significant pay bump, a few things they're thinking, okay, is this going to happen every year? Cause that's right. not realistic. And you're starting to weigh like, okay, are you worth a pay bump after one year? Cause we're yeah. not that far into this relationship where, you know, yeah. actually I was thinking like we might be better off with a better candidate, but after five years of, you know, investment and growth and development, uh, 
a church leader is thinking, man, do we want to start back at the beginning? We've already right. invested five years in this person and they've shown loyal. Right. So yeah, there's definitely that balance. This might be the best nugget of our conversation then, because I think now if you're interviewing somewhere, you got to really seriously ask yourself, can I make you know incremental raises for five years? And do I love this place enough to make that that bet? So that's that's good. That's good for people uh, to know. Well, I often will. I'll often have a conversation with a potential candidate who has longevity in organization. They're thinking, you know, we're thinking we might be ready to move on, and but they're not sure. And I'll say, hey, just remember the ten years of of tenure you have at this organization is worth about ten to fifteen grand's worth of salary. And the reason I say that is because there's a freedom and a trust that comes from being in a place that long. Well, that's a that's another side of it, because I'm not going to say who this was, but I was hanging out with someone recently and they make, they make a lot more money than me, but they also don't like their job. And by the time we whittled it down, they made about the same money. Like They were willing to take a pay, a massive pay cut to describe how they felt about their job the way I did. So that's something to consider. Mm-hmm. And Tim, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you're considering taking a new position, you should probably feel fairly confident that you can survive off that salary for the next five years. Mm-hmm. Yep. That, that you shouldn't assume like, okay, I'm going to get a big pay bump increase in one to two years, and so I'll suffer through this first year because then I'll make a lot more money then. Like, that's unless not you walk, unless you walk in with them giving giving you specific measures you need to hit that have bonuses tied to it. And we see churches that do that. But if, if there's not that, then you need to be ready to to live on that salary for the next five years. I'm not saying that you will, but it's it, it's probably good practice to assume. Look, Bill, if your volunteers are speaking in tongues by year two, there's a big bump that comes with that. <laughs> and a quick sidebar, um, is there like a, a typical expected range for moving expenses when you're hiring a candidate from a different state? Uh, again, that's that's all over the board, but we would say if you're coming from another state, on the low end, two to three grand; on the high end, seven. Okay. Dang it! I didn't move to take this job. I should have moved, <laughs> shouldn't I? No. <laughs> it's nice not to have to move. Trust me. We would have given I you moved. nine dollars. <laughs> I moved to the other side of the world, friends. Oh, that's right. So they gave you thirty thousand dollars for moving expenses, right? I can't comment on that. <laughs> oh, all right. Look at Tim. But it was but it but it was more than the range that I gave you. Oh wow. There we go. The dirt. So let's talk about some skills that pay the bills, um, that boost the salaries. You kind of I think everyone wants to know what do I gotta do to make more money? We're all just hard hardwired that way. Even even non greedy people. Like I just want to give people permission to fill that because they felt that in the survey. Um, so you see these kind of skills that make or break salary offers. So like what's some stuff that you see? The uh, first thing I think we wanted to hit was education because yeah. that's a weird topic for tech people. Cause I'll take a volunteer from, you know, high school to two years in college over a four year degree yeah. or like, how do you kind of go over education and value on this? Yeah. Education is not as big a one in the production field. It's uh, being able to establish skills with certain, obviously, certain gear and and software and all all kinds of of, of skill demonstration. Um, that that really overtakes the education piece. And also, I mean, you know, in the production space, it's 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 more like training on on certain equipment or workshops that people have done and being able to list that. Um, but being able to uh, to communicate really well how you have built teams, how you have mobilized volunteers, and how you uh, demonstrate EQ, that's a big thing with churches. So then, you know, if I was if I'm listening to this thinking I want to make more money, would you advise, hey, don't get whatever that other degree is like, just you know, ace this next skill set or what's the the next you know. I don't know how to That's what I'm how saying. to ask this question because I don't know enough tech stuff to say like find that, but you would you'd lean that way. Yeah, I would absolutely lean that way. And again, if you're a you know young tech and you're looking to advance in your career, go to your uh, executive pastor or leadership and say, "Hey, I want to be the kind of candidate that you'd be looking for for a good paying job. What skill set should I be working towards? What should I be adding to my arsenal?" Like executive again, pastors, a great, a great love question, that. Toby. They and they love those questions. Be asking those questions often. And Tim, um, 
when you get a large church, 2000 people plus that are willing to pay, you know, 75 to 90, like a, a healthy salary range, what like minimum amount of experience, like years of experience, do you think they're starting with when they're willing to pay at that level? Four to five years. Okay. So it's not mm-hmm. that bad. So you could be 30 years old and great at what you do with that level of experience and command, you know, 80,000 plus a year. Yeah. If you have the skill level to match and the people skills. Mm-hmm. And then whenever you're the TD in this, uh, what do we call him in Caleb or Matt's episode? Was it Billy? Oh, yeah, Billy. When you're Billy the Tech, uh, let's say Billy is, you know, he's put his Timmy, five. Timmy the Tech? There we go. <laughs> Timmy the Tech. Tommy the Tech. I like that alliteration. So Tommy the Tech? Tommy the Tech has done his five years. He's acing it. Like, who does he start that conversation with to, like, say, hey, I'd like to talk about raises. Is it automatically the exec pastor? Is it the creative arts pastor? Is it... <laughs> I would imagine that the supervisor, if it's not the exec pastor, may be a little miffed if you went around him straight to the exec and you want him to be your advocate. Now, there may be some people listening that say, oh, I've had that conversation so many times. Then there, there probably needs to be a conversation saying to your supervisor, hey, we've had this conversation a lot of times. Um, I'd like to go to um, our executive pastor and just chat a bit and ask him some questions, but I don't want to do that without your knowledge. I think you've got to really respect the people in your organization. And they might say, I, I I don't want you to do that. And there may be a bit of a come to Jesus where you've got to say, well, you know, we've had this conversation lots of times and I I just like a, a conversation with our exec pastor. And so, yeah, it, it can get a little. I'm an eight uh, and I feel squirmy on that thought. <laughs> like, because I know how awkward that's going to make them feel. But it ha- it's going to be worse if you go around them, right? Yeah. There's a lot of like things. If I... you think, of, think about this, Blake. If your supervisor is an eight, so put yourself in the supervisor's shoes. His supervisor employee, is an eight. And I do go around him all the time to Toby, <laughs> so now I'm really concerned. I'm just kidding. Yeah, you, might want to, you, might, you might want to take a temperature on that relationship. I'm going to get fired before the series is over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Tim. Um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but we are assuming that there are $100,000 a year plus jobs out there. Well, our survey mm. said that. We had, I think, 8 to 10%. Well, it said 90% plus on our... So um, that we're assuming those jobs are out there. They're probably few and far between. But if a church is willing to pay that, what's what's kind of that you know archetype of the, that church? Is that a really big church that places a super high value on production? And is there a you bunch are, of stress that comes with that? Yeah, there's a bunch of stress that comes with that. You're looking at uh, a, a mega church as we as we often say with multiple campuses and that's probably a central role and so global role central role at a mega church multi, multiple campuses what are they expecting in a candidate they're going to pay 100k plus for uh they're expecting somebody who used to do it but no longer does it they lead it so somebody that's 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 not a doer but a leader of leaders, somebody that gives it away, somebody that knows how to keep the the excellence level high while also developing leaders to do the roles, somebody who can build teams, uh, recruit teams, both of paid people because if you're making that much money, you're going to have direct reports, but also a bunch of volunteers. So there's going to be high EQ, high people skills, high management skills, and you're probably not going to be standing at the console mixing in the main room some maybe but that's going to limit your leadership so you're not i mean it's like it's like in the worship space you know you probably no longer on the stage you're leading a bunch of worship leaders so that's usually what at that kind of a salary that's usually what that leader is doing and so realistically you could perhaps be a front of house engineer at a large church and they're paying you, let's say $75,000 a year. And they've written in a bit of flexibility to contract outside and you could be pulling in a hundred thousand dollars a year when you add those things up. But if you're going to go into a global leadership role where the church is paying you a hundred thousand dollars plus, you're not outside contracting anymore. I I don't know the, I, I don't know. You've got the emotional energy to do that. Given the, given the level of leadership that's required from you. 
This is actually a really fun, like, if then, then, then that question, because it's almost like, are you talking people down if they're at 75 and they want to get to hundred, but you're like, Hey, you're not going to be mixing anymore. Or, Hey, mm-hmm. you're not going to be doing outside work. Like, do you ever find yourself talking candidates out of taking jobs that are paying a lot? Cause you don't think they'll actually want to do all that's required of that. We don't find ourselves talking candidates <laughs> out of it. We, we contextualize it for the candidate. So they can decide. We want to help them process it. Like we see this definitely in the worship world. You've got a 38-year-old, 42-year-old worship pastor who loves being on the stage. They want to move to a bigger church with multiple campuses. And it's like, are you ready to step off the stage? Because we know how much you love doing that. And so it's it's clarifying who you are, who you want to be, where you're headed. Uh, there's a there's a lot of those kinds of clarifying conversations that we'll have. I mean, at Slingshot, we've got a whole division devoted to candidate development, candidate relations. And a lot of that is helping pastor the candidate or the leader through this transitional time where they're working out, okay, I get to reinvent myself now as a leader in this in this job search. What do I what do I want to be? What what are the values for me? What are the what are the focus areas? Okay, Tim. So uh, we've you've mentioned it several times the the EQ, and we're talking about technical people that typically are very high in IQ. They're incredibly intelligent people. They're very technical, and often they deal with the EQs. They are are very introverted as well, and and they can struggle with the relationship. What are some of the you know first resources that come to your mind when you're helping people grow in their EQ? So, I mean, just to uh, d- define it a little more, EQ is obviously the soft skills, how you work with other people. I think uh, I think personality uh, testing and profiling is a really helpful way to learn more about who you are. The highest value we see in successful leaders is uh, is self awareness, and I think it was I think it was Thomas Akempis who said, "A greater self knowledge is the surest pathway to God," because I believe he wants us to know how he uniquely wired us. And then to bring our full selves to whatever vocation we feel called to. And so I would say to any production leader listening who wants to grow in their EQ, it's like take a bunch of different personality tests, like, you know, the disc and the Enneagram and the insights. And the, I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, learn more about yourself. Learn more about what makes you tick. Learn where your weakness is so you can surround yourself with people that are strong in those areas and learn how you can grow uh, in the areas where you're weak. And I would also encourage some of our listeners, if you know, if you're thinking, well, I really want to work towards that $100,000 a year plus job, as Tim has talked about, that is a highly relational job. And maybe you don't want to live out a highly relational job. Maybe you you really enjoy the technical side of your work. You're more introverted. You like to be by yourself. Mm. Maybe you want to be a systems engineer at a large church. Maybe you want to be the A1, and it's it's less relational and more focused on the gear. And so you you've got to, like you said, know yourself whether you want right. to engage with people every single day and develop those relationships. Yeah, I mean, Correct. <laughs> Tim, I want to put you back in the hot seat a little bit in the sense that I want to force you into an answer on, on this topic. It sounds to me like, you know, you can have the mixing skills of Corey Edwards and Jeff Sandstrom combined, but that's never going to be enough in that 100K tier. Like that top tier, I don't care if you are that level mixer or whatever, or that level video director or lighting director, it's that plus EQ to get there. Like there's just no way unless you have that as well. Is that, would you say that's accurate? Well, well, I mean, we're talking, when you're talking Jeff and Corey, they are at the top echelon. I am not going to say what a, I mean, I could name the the churches we all know around the country would pay an A1 like Jeff or Corey to mix for them every year. Sorry, every weekend. So they might put the bake some uh, some freedom to go and do some touring with whoever because we know they do that. But I'm I'm not saying that there are churches in the country that wouldn't pay a hundred plus to have a Jeff or a Corey be there uh, a one week in week out. But a, a majority, if you want to make a hundred plus, you have to be developed in those other areas to, to lead teams and lead people. And I'd say there are a lot of people out there that they don't necessarily have that pastoral heart. God hasn't created them to be a pastor in a, you know, 
monetary sense, in a professional sense. And maybe, you know, a Jeff or a Corey, they're out touring, they're out with Elevation. But also, mm-hmm. like you're saying, a church may want to contract them and pay them very well on the weekends. And yep. Yep. they are just at the top tier of their craft. And right. and they pull in $100,000 a year because of that level. But also, they don't pastor people. Like, that that is possible out there, and it it might take both the church. Well, I will say that I, I don't know Corey personally, but I know Jeff personally. Jeff pastors people. I was about to say so, Jeff so, pastors us every yeah. time he talks to us. I <laughs> so, love that man. So I'm not I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure he's a good example because of how because of how high EQ he has. Um, but yeah, it's you've got to develop. You've got to develop in multiple areas and grow. And unless you are absolutely at peace with, um, like you said, Toby, you just want to work the gear. And uh, you just keep getting better and better at working the gear. Tim, I've got one last bonus question for you. This was something we hammered out like ad nauseum with Caleb Lepke. Um, uh, I'm going to give you a magic wand. You get to just decide what the, sal- the starting salary is for the average like starting church tech and then the medium range. So we've talked a lot about the top tier at this point. Average and medium are the same things, Blake. Well, no, I'm talking about tiers. That was confusing, but like, you know, you're a starting tech, you that, you're Honestly, the mid, mid-level. Yeah. What would you, what would you give as just, I know we're generalizing heavily, but like, if you were going to give a range, what would you give the range for those two? If you could just magically say churches, this is what it is now. I'm going to save you the heartache. I'm not I am going, I'm going to be defiant <gasps> and I'm not going to give you the beginning range. Because I know we have so many people out there that are serving at amazing churches that are getting low salaries. And I, I absolutely do not, do not want to sow any discontent because that might be your calling and God might be providing for you in amazing ways in order for you to stay blessing that group of people, that community of people. If I could say what the mid-range would be, what I'd love to see it be, given where I see culture right now and given the priority of this of this position in churches and knowing what I know about salary ranges across the board, I would love a mid-range to be around 70 to 75. I would love it to be that. I would love it to be that. Um, what's realistic? I don't know because I don't know the ins and outs of every church. We say every search engagement we we do is unique. And that's why saying that is such a hard, that's why I won't say what the beginning would be. This is what I would love to see it be, because I believe that's that's closer to a to a, to a living wage. And, but I also know that I, I mean, we're talking to churches every day that have challenges around uh, around resources, and we're extremely compassionate towards that. And we never say that a role is unsearchable. There are obviously things that contribute to being unsearchable, but we never want to limit God's power to move and call somebody to a given role. And Tim, so I didn't stay on. I didn't stay on that hot seat. And Tim, I'm assuming in the 70, 75 median range, you're talking more towards, you know, tech directors, production directors, like leadership roles with experience rather than an entry level position. Oh, definitely. No, I'm saying, yeah, that's that's the mid range of tech directors. Okay, Tim, uh, one one last bonus question, because this, I think, is the hardest one of them all. Um, If you were talking to a tech director and like we've talked about this all the time as we've gone over the survey, you're never going to make as much at a church as you are in the secular world. You're just not. Mm. Do you find yourself having to say that? And would you say that? Like, look, I don't know what that percentage is, but it's the church discount. Like, you're not mm. going to make as much working for a church. It's just kind of how it is. Uh, we will have that conversation with uh, production folks that are, are struggling with church or marketplace. And uh, a lot of our people have been in both and we can talk about what a privilege it is to serve in the local church and how God provides and the stories of life change that you get to be a part of and the eternal investment that that role is. Now, I know uh, we can make a huge impact for the kingdom in the marketplace. I'm, I'm not discounting that for a second, but the opportunity of getting to serve full time in local church ministry, there's nothing like it. And there's also the reality to consider of, you know, do you want to stay in this city where you're fa- with your family 
then maybe mm-hmm. full-time church ministry is actually the most that you can make doing your profession. You know, in order to go out into the industry and make more money, you may have to relocate. You may have to travel a lot. Um, it's not like everybody lives in Hollywood and is a video director at a church where they could be making twice as much out in the industry. Like it totally depends on where you live and what you want to do. There is a big value to not being on the road all the time. I got a good friend who has done lighting design for Keith Urban, John Mayer, all of this. And he's now got a one-year-old kid. And mm. he was right about to go on tour. He hands his kid over to the child care worker. His kid starts crying. He said, I immediately knew I was done. I mean, he accepted a job offer in town, was done. I mean, he was doing the biggest names in the world. It was done. Yeah, we that is a that is a story we hear often and a conversation we have often uh with with worship leaders and uh and production people. They're coming off the road, they can't do it anymore. Mm. And you also, I think, you know, as a church, you need to honor that in, okay, used to work with the biggest names in the world. And we've had guests on that are full-time at their churches that used to work with the biggest names in the world. And, you know, they're worth their wage. They're worth it. Mm. And so to, uh, you know, to bless them because of that, you're, you're getting gold in that person and their abilities. Yeah. Well, Tim, uh, we love drinking from the fountain of your wisdom anytime we can, uh, we're going to wrap us here on a tech takeaway. And I, the tech takeaway is we kind of adjusted it for the series. It was kind of like, hey, if you could tell, you know, an exec pastor or a tech director or a lead pastor, worship leader, whatever, if you're going to tell them one thing kind of to wrap up your episode, you know, whether it's encouragement or another takeaway, whatever that may be, what would you kind of wrap us up here on? I would say as a tech director, and this is from uh, my years in the local church, be the person who takes care of things. You know, I've learned that that some of the six most important words in leadership is I will take care of that and be that person because that's the most valuable person on a team who puts up their hands and says, I don't take care of that. Uh, Whether it be people issues, whether it be gear issues, whether it be production issues, always be looking for the opportunity to help because helping is the most powerful thing you can do in leadership. Toby, you're a business owner. Does that resonate with you? (laughs) What? (laughs) I'm just saying that resonates with me, like in the core of my existence to know that one of my, you know, guys or girls puts her hand up, said, I'll take care of that. And I don't have to give it a second thought because I know it. That's why one of our core values is we own it, it, which is exactly that. I will take care of it. Amen. That's that's it. Well, Tim, we cannot thank you enough. You've given us so much of your time. Uh, Is there anything you'd like to plug uh, to send people to if they've heard this and they're like, I need some more of that Australian goodness. I want to smell Mm. the the Tim Foot cooking (laughs) smell. (laughs) Only, I mean, Kayla probably did this and maybe maybe Matt did. If we can help you, just come over to slingshotgroup.org. We would love to be a part of your journey. Um, maybe you're an exec pastor listening or a worship pastor who's building a team. That's what we love to do. And we're in it for building the kingdom. And so come, come meet us, come see us, come talk to us. We'd love to help you. Yeah, I mean, just a message from Church Gear here. Slingshot didn't, you know, pay us to be on the series or like we just love them so much and think they're so great at what they do. So that's why we had three of them on for this series. So we're big fans. If, well, you, if you could use a search uh, agency, we would highly recommend them. Thank you, Blake. And thank you, Toby. And likewise with Church Gear, you were doing amazing work out there. I mean, Toby, just a couple of weeks ago, I sent a church plan to your way knowing that you guys would take care of them. And the way that you are repurposing uh, all the gear that I used to have in the back hallway when I was in arts ministry, it's brilliant the work that you are doing. It's innovative the work that you are doing and you're great people doing it. And so thank you for that too. Gushing. Don't gushing, make me gushing. don't make me cry. <laughs> it is funny to be innovative violins. with old gear. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah we need where's lots those of violins, violins again? <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, Tim, we're Thanks really, for having me. Thanks for coming on. Fellas. Yeah. Thanks for hanging out with us. We hope to see you back next week for more absurd stories, tech takeaways, and overall buffoonery here at the Church Gear Studios. Okay, Blake, are we going to like repair the flub of our last week's outro and properly acknowledge Tim's foot on this outro? You know, I had two left feet when I was talking about Tim's foot and it caused me to trip over myself and I would like to not do it this time. You definitely put Tim's foot in your mouth. 
Oh, you know, I I did, but it tasted delicious because as we were talking about, we cooked <laughs> we cooked him the whole episode. He was on the hot seat. It was is fully cooked. And if you want more of Tim's foot, you should kick off your weekend with a foot long sub from Subway. I don't know. I'm just you know I'm really reaching. Now. Or 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 I thought you were gonna you were set yourself up so perfect. Kick off with his other episode that's in our feed. You know how three episodes of Tim Foot in the feed. So, and it's also the kickoff of football season as well. So that's very exciting for our listening audience also. That's right. So go feast on that foot and you let us know how you like this episode. Make sure you take the survey. Send the episode to a friend. We're having a great time.